Um, and today, this morning, we will be doing a program about the Atlantic City experience and the, the Roaring Twenties. So let me introduce our speakers today. <clears throat> um, our first speaker is Heather Perez. She is the archivist and reference librarian of the Atlantic City Free Public Library. She came to New Jersey from the University of Maryland College Park's campus of information, College of Information Studies, where she received her MLS with a specialization in archives and records management. While in graduate school, she worked at the National Archives Library Information Center and interned at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Heather oversees the Atlantic City Heritage Collections at ACFPL. Include, uh, these include the Heston Room, the Hester Room and the Atlantic City Historical Museum. The collections include books, manuscripts, photographs, maps, memorabilia, and audiovisual materials related to Atlantic City's history and the people and its cultural significance. And then we will have our next speaker, Vicki Gold Levy, who was born and raised here in Atlantic City and is the daughter of Al Gold, the city's first official photographer. Now living in New York City, Vicki is a picture editor and co-author of the well-known book, Atlantic City 125 Years of Ocean Madness. She has also worked on several Broadway show shows, including Steel Pier, and is now the historical consultant for HBO's Boardwalk Empire. She is a co-founder of our Atlantic City Historical Museum and the director of the museum's video, Boardwalk Valley Who. Vicki consulted on films Atlantic City and Beaches, as well as Disney World's Boardwalk Resort in Orlando. She can be seen in the PBS film, There She Is, Miss America, and the HBO documentary, Atlantic City, The Original Sin City. Vicki was Bess Meyerson's page when she was Miss America in 1945, and judged Miss America pageant in 1998. She has also recently judged Miss America twice at Boardwalk Hall. Her current project, in Atlantic City is helping to restore the world's largest pipe organ at Boardwalk Hall. Vicki has authored four other books, including Cuba Style, and is currently developing the book on New Orleans Style. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Heather. And let me turn the mic over to Heather, and let's get started on our Roaring Twenties. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Beth. She didn't introduce herself, I guess, but this is Beth Ryan, our museum coordinator here. And uh, we're very happy to be here today and to talk a little bit about the Roaring Twenties. And maybe some of you are, are fans of the show uh, that has made them very popular lately, uh, the Boardwalk Empire, or Boardwalk Empire and HBO. Um, Vicki and I both uh, are historical consultants for the show. So we like to think that we know a little bit about the 1920s here in Atlantic City, although neither of us has the, the blessing of being able to enjoy them firsthand. We, we, yeah, we're not that old. We do like history, but we're not that old. Um, but we, we do like to think that we know a little bit about the 1920s. So what we'll do today is I'll talk a little bit about the people and the things going on in here in the city, and Vicki's going to talk a little bit about the fun things, the, the culture and, and life in the 1920s. And then uh, we'll, we'll open it up for questions. You're welcome to ask any question you like. If we don't know the answer, we'll see if we can find out later for you. Um, but we, we are very happy to have you here this morning. So first slide, please. There. So I'd like to introduce you to a couple of the, the characters of Atlantic City, who are actually the real characters of Atlantic City. Um, first up is our mayor, Mayor Edward Bader. He was born in Philadelphia in 1874. And interestingly, Mayor Bader was a standout football player. He played college ball as well as professional football in Pennsylvania before he finally came to Atlantic City in 1902. And when he first came, he was kind of a jack of all trades. He started out in the uh, garbage and sewage business and then moved on to his, owning his own general contracting business. He helped rebuild Steel Pier after a storm hit down. And he also built Route 40 across the meadows into Atlantic City. And Mayor Bader was elected as a city commissioner, and he served as the director of public affairs and was selected as the mayor. At that time, there was a commission system here in Atlantic City, so a group of five commissioners ruled the city. And Mayor Bader was elected uh, to be the mayor from among those. And he was the mayor for most of the 1920s, um, serving until um, 1927. Under his leadership, a lot of great things happened in the city. The traffic signals were installed, uh, drainage systems were upgraded, they built comfort stations along the boardwalk. Some of, some of his improvements and some of the things that he is responsible for are actually visible today. He did die in office. He uh, died in 1927, 
and then for the rest of the decade, uh, Anthony Rufo was Rufo was the mayor. Next slide. Up next is another familiar face. I'm sure that you're all you all know a lot about. This is the Commodore. His name is Louis Kuhnle. Is the way that you say that. He was from a German family, a family who immigrated here from Germany, and he was born in New York City in 1857. But his family moved there here the following year, and they were in the hotel business. They had a hotel at South Carolina and Atlantic, and it was a big meeting place for politicians, and it gained kind of a notorious reputation for other shady practices at the, at the hotel. Uh, he was the first of the political bosses here in Atlantic City. He controlled the city de facto as a political boss, a uh, Republican Party, of course, uh, from the late 1880s until 1911, when he was indicted for voter fraud. Um, they gave the tradition, as, as I'm sure you know, also of, of, a, of a lot of uh, corruption in the city. Um, but he did do a lot of really wonderful things as in his role uh, in the city. He worked to establish a phone company here, a gas company. He was involved in building the boardwalk uh, in, the, in the several iterations of the boardwalk. And he also started the city's waterworks. And the name Commodore came from his appointment. Uh, he helped to found the Atlantic City Yacht Club, and he was the first Commodore of the Yacht Club. And furthermore, he was known as the Commodore quite frequently. He was convicted in 1913 of voter fraud, and he served six months in prison, and then he took an extended vacation away from the city. And when he returned, uh, Nucky Johnson was the de facto boss of the city. And so Nucky helped the Commodore get a, a position as the city commissioner. And so the Commodore was actually elected as the city commissioner, and he served uh, as the commissioner of parks and public property from 1920 all the way up until 1934. Um, and he did die in 1934, so he, he stayed in power even though he uh, he had fallen from, from the top position. He never married, um, and there is a street name for him in Venice Park. If you drive over the bridges into Venice Park, you'll see uh, there is a Coonley Avenue, and that is the sole uh, dedication to him in the city, um, even though he did do many wonderful things and, and served many years as a public figure. I want to introduce you to Bessie Townsend. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of her. If anyone does, I'd love to get a copy. Um, Bessie Townsend is, is one that I just discovered lately. And she was the city comptroller for 50 years. And I, I you know, if you, if you count backwards, she was the city comptroller in, in 1912, a female. Um, and so I, I have a lot of respect for her. She was, uh, point, she was a 1902 uh, Atlantic City High School graduate. And then she went to the work for the city as a stenographer or a typist um, in that time period. And she um, moved up through her, through her office. And then in 1912, she was appointed as the acting comptroller following, following some political maneuverings that ousted the, the comptroller. And uh, in 1913, she was finally appointed the comptroller after a number of legal battles, which included a visit to this, the New Jersey Supreme Court over some wording and laws in the legal codes that, that indicated that he shall be appointed. So therefore, she could not be appointed comptroller. But they were they did were managed they did manage to uh, rule that he could be either one. And so she was appointed the first comptroller, uh, the first female comptroller to serve in New Jersey. And as far as the records can tell, she was the first female comptroller in the, in the United States. Um, and so I think she's a, a very interesting figure, and I would like to get a picture of her. Um, she would also served as the acting mayor on several occasions because of the rules of Atlantic City. If certain commissioners were not available to serve as acting mayor, therefore it fell to the role of the comptroller. So a female was, was in the 1920s, she was mayor several times during some out-of-town visits by the other commissioners. She retired in 1962 after serving 50 years, and she did die in 1968. And this is another one of the commissioners in the 1920s, and he was another long-serving commissioner. If you see the pattern here, a lot of long-serving political figures in Atlantic City, especially during this decade. Um, William Cuthbert was the commissioner of public safety. He came to Atlantic City in the late 1870s, and his family owned a, a very popular type of business at that time period, a back house. And you know, if you think about it, people coming down the shore for the, for, to visit the shore for the first time, or to visit the, the beaches, they didn't have their own baths, their own bathing suits. They didn't have, um, you know, these kinds of things. It wasn't as common for them. And so they would rent them, and they'd go to these bath houses that had, you know, individual rooms, and they'd rent their bathing suits, and they'd, they'd go out to the beach for the day. Um, so his family did own a bath house at South Carolina in the beach, and he was a volunteer fireman for over 50 years. Uh, he was started as a charter member of the Beach Pirates Company, which was a volunteer group that uh, 
was around before the official fire department was, and he continued to turn out to fight fires well into his, <coughs> his 70s. He was a, a prolific firefighter. Um, during the 1920s, he was the city commissioner for public safety, and he oversaw a lot of the, uh, the well, he oversaw the, the police department and fire department, so, you know, he, he saw a lot of the uh, corruption and things that went on, but he also saw a lot of the, uh, the back the backdoor gambling and then things like that as well, and turned, turned his eye. Um, <coughs> next slide, please. And here's our, our character that we all know and love from, from the show. This is Enoch Lewis Nucky Johnson. Nucky comes from, from his first name. And of course, in the show, he's known as Nucky Thompson. Um, but Nucky was born in Smithville, New Jersey, just over the, just over the way there, in 1883. And he is a, grad, is a graduate of the high school also in 1900. And he was appointed as his father's undersheriff in 1905, and then elected as sheriff in 1908. During the 1920s, he was the Atlantic County Treasurer, and he was elected to that position first in 1914. And then he also clerked during the <coughs> for the New Jersey Supreme Court um, at, at the very beginning of the decade. He, had, he never actually held an elected office in Atlantic City, which is surprising given his, uh, his role in the city. Um, and of course, he had he has his uh, list of suspected criminal activities, proved or unproved. Um, he headed up a large, uh, he headed up the Re Republican Party here, and uh, pretty much controlled most of what went on. Most of the jobs uh, that were appointed as, as uh, political positions went through him first. Uh, he took payoffs for gambling, prostitution, um, alcohol smuggling, and production. A lot of these types of things. Um, that the federal government was never quite able to prove, but they were pretty sure that they were floating around. Mm -hmm. um, and he did leave, live a very lavish lifestyle. He um, took up he took up residence in the Ritz Carlton, which was brand new in the 1920s, and had an apartment on Central Park and cars and servants and lavish meals and um, very um, a very a very lavish <laughs> lots of women. Yes, yes. He, he led the good life. Uh, for all intents and purposes. He was investigated, of course, several times by the federal government, and he was eventually convicted of tax evasion. They couldn't get him on anything stronger than that. And he was in the federal penitentiary for four years, from 1941 to 1945. So I'm sorry if I'm spoiling the show for anybody. Hopefully you, know, hopefully you already knew the ending to this story. Uh, he was married twice. His first wife died in 1913, even before he was really in power. Um, and it, it uh, did very much affect him from what uh, we read in the accounts. And he later married Florence Osbeck the day he, before he went to jail in 1941. He died in 1968, and he is buried in um, Egg Harbor Township on Zion Road, in Zion Road um, Methodist uh, Cemetery. Methodist? The cemetery on Zion Road. I can't quite remember the denomination. All right. And then there's a couple other characters that I'd like to introduce you to. I don't have a slide for them, but uh, uh, some of the other some of the other folks that uh, crop up in the show, or that, that should crop up in the show. Uh, Lance Sobet came to Atlantic City in 1920. In the show, you'll see Gobet's um, club, or her um, bar and club. And she married Dan Stebbins, who owned a small club on Pacific Avenue, not on the boardwalk on Pacific Avenue. And it was known as the Golden Inn in the 1920s. Uh, later on, they did expand and put in some new things, and they were just like the same as Gobet's. Uh, and it was one of the suspected locations of illegal gambling and alcohol distribution. Um, and then another uh, very prominent businesswoman at the time was Sarah Spencer Washington, who was a businesswoman and entrepreneur. She founded the Apex Hair and News Company in 1920 on Arctic Avenue. And that later led to a whole network of stores, salons, laboratories, schools. She, she was one of the first um, African-American millionaires in the United States. And she was based right here in Atlantic City. And she was also very dedicated to the social needs of her community. Um, she built rest homes, golf courses. Um, you know, she was very active in the Atlantic City Board of Trade, which was a, an institution or a group of business owners on the north side that, that were dedicated to promoting the businesses of the African American community. And um, so let's step back. We, we've met some of the characters now. So let's step back and take a look at what Atlantic City was like in the 1920s. Um, there was only a permanent population. Uh, there was a permanent population, according to the census, of about 50,000 people. So you think about, you know, a few more than there are today as, a, as the permanent population. But the numbers of visitors that were arriving, especially in the summer, was phenomenal. Hundreds of thousands would arrive every summer. And as many of us know, as, as many of us uh, have read, prohibition was 
largely ignored here in the Atlantic City. You know, it, it, it didn't really happen. Um, it was flaunted, I guess, right in the face of most of the most of the security officials and things, or most of them were on the take so that they looked the other way. Um, but it just was not observed. And the reasoning behind that, uh, for 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 most part, is because this was a tourist town, and people wanted to come and have a good time, and so they wanted the freedom to do things that they couldn't do back home, and Atlanta City let them do that. So that was the atmosphere here in the, in the city. A lot, of, um, a lot of fun was going on. And I do want to show you a couple of the, the new things you would have seen if you were here in the 1920s. First of all, you would have seen the Ritz-Carlton, which was a, a brand new hotel in 1921. And of course, that's where Nucky had a residence of. By, by uh, folklore, says that he had an entire floor of the Ritz, uh, seventh or ninth, I hear different stories. Um, and I'm sure he had a lovely view of the entire city from wherever he was. So. Next slide, please. And then there was uh, the brand new department store, Glass. And that went up in the 1920s. There, by the way, there's a prize to, the, to somebody who can tell me which of these buildings is going up. What was up in the 19, or that is, which of these buildings that was going up in the 1920s is still up. You can tell me that at the end. We'll get you a prize. So we have the Ritz Carlton Glass. Um, that went up in 1922 and was a very renowned department store. The World War One Memorial went up and it was, of course, a big role in the past episode or the past episodes of the uh, of the show on HBO. And the World War One Memorial uh, was built in 1922 and finally dedicated in 1923. Uh, Young's Ocean Pier, which had been around for a while, uh, was destroyed in 1912 by a pretty devastating fire, but it was rebuilt and renamed uh, Central Pier in 1922. And then the Atlantic City High School, which so many people um, know and love from their, their time there, that was actually dedicated in the 1920s, uh, right there on Albany Avenue. The All Wars Memorial Buildings, two of them actually were built in the 1920s. In 1924, there was one at Pacific and States Avenue that was dedicated for the, the white veterans. And then in 1925, the West Side, or the All Old Soldiers Home, um, was dedicated for the African American veterans. In 1926, and then dedicated in 1927, the Masonic Temple went up down sort of near the, the World War I Memorial. And the Boardwalk National Bank at, on Boardwalk uh, between Tennessee and Ocean, that went up in the later 20s, as well as the Knights of Columbus Building and the National Guard's Armory Building out on <coughs> Route 30 going out of the city. That, those all went up in the 1920s. The YWCA at North Carolina and Pacific went up in the 1920s. Convention Hall, which was a very, very big deal. Um, you know, for years, the politicians have been trying to get uh, businesses here in the off-season, and one of the ways to do that was to host conventions. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, and so they would, uh, they, they're trying to build this magnificent convention hall for many, many years. Also, in 1929, the Fountain of Light in Brighton Park was dedicated. So that, I know that's not a complete list of buildings that went up in the 1920s, and, um, but uh, that, those were some of the new things you would have seen here in the 1920s. Other things that were happening in the 1920s, the Miss America pageant started in 1921 as an inner city beauty pageant, and I don't think he wants to talk a little bit about that, so I won't talk more. And the Diving Horse actually first started at Still Fear in 1929. A lot of things happened in the 1920s. It was a great decade here in Atlantic City. Um, communications improvements were going on, the traffic signals were first put in place, so all of the wonderful traffic signals we see now started in the 20s. And dial telephones, the, the ability to first dial somebody directly happened in the 1920s, as did the first ship to shore call from Atlantic City. Um, I do want to just take a minute to, to, first of all, thank you all for coming today, but I also want to take a minute to do a little plug. Um, the Atlantic City Experience is actually a brand that the library is developing and it's um it's our it's our first step to developing a, a major cultural <laughs> and heritage attraction for atlantic city we have our very pure museum here our atlantic city historical museum which we we all love very much but we want to make something bigger and we want atlantic city history to get the space and the recognition that it deserves so on october 22nd uh, it's a monday october 22nd at 2 p.m in the city council uh chambers the library has been conducting a feasibility study. We've had some consultants doing a feasibility study about this larger museum, and they will present their findings on October 22nd at 2 p.m. So we do invite you all to attend for that and to hear more about what that bigger Atlantic City experience uh, will be and what we hope it will be. 